All right, well, for starters, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, in light of all the North Carolina voter rights controversy, we want to talk to you about um, some of your experiences as well as today's current events. Um, so for starters, we know that you spoke on the floor of the North Carolina House during the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, um, and you mentioned that you spent time in eastern North Carolina trying to register citizens to vote, and so we were wondering yep. if you could speak about those experiences. Well, that was, uh, I guess, leading up to the actual ena enactment of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. A group of us, a fellow named John Edwards, not the senator, former senator, but John Edwards, who was head of the Voter Education Project, uh, Ben Ruffin, John Lewis and I uh, decided that we would go east uh, where we had packets of, of black folks living mm -hmm. and start getting them, uh, get, trying to get them to register to vote. Well, we went east and southeast and almost in, I guess, uh, we would go in and we'd say, we came in to see about getting you all registered to vote. Get out of here, get out of here. You're going to get us lynched, you're going to get us killed, you're going to get us fired from jobs. And it, it was like that. Uh, and uh, that was the, just the general tenor that came out. Out of black families that were really, uh, they had been intimidated to the point that they, uh, uh, they were just afraid to do anything that would upset the apple cart. Mm -hmm. So was this before or after you marched in Selma? After what? Was this before or after you marched at Selma, Re trying to register citizens to vote? Before what? Uh, were you in eastern North Carolina trying to register citizens before or after you marched at Selma? Uh, this was, um, that was, this was the summer of 65. I'm trying to remember. I went to, I went to Selma. You're getting me on my dates now. <laughs> Jimmy Lee Jackson got killed. Uh, Martin called. I did not go to Selma on Bloody Sunday. Did I, neither did I go on Turnaround Tuesday, which was the following Tuesday. I went on that Thursday following that. Uh, it was probably when, when I, after, after folks had gone, I stayed in Selma. I stayed on the march mm -hmm. in Selma uh, for a day and a half and came back, and I think it was the following week that uh, John and we, we decided to go down there because we felt that there was a, that, that, that it was going to work, that things were going to be moved pretty fast. And they did move faster than we thought they were going to move. And uh, so that's when, it, that, that was about when, when, when that happened. I'm talking, 60, I'm talking early 64, middle 64. I think uh, the president signed the bill in August of 65, 65, yeah. Um, so speaking of Selma, we know that Reverend Barber has compared today's voting rights battle to Selma, and I was just wondering if you thought that that was an accurate comparison. Yeah, I, I think it is an accurate comparison because what is happening is we, we are retrogressing. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the progress we made, and this has been my problem, uh, <clears throat> basically all of the legislation that has been passed in North Carolina involving voting rights has my name on it, or one or two pieces that doesn't have my name on it, but I co-sponsored them. Ellie Canary did one of the pieces in the Senate, and I handled it for her in the House. But starting with, with Have a Help America Vote Act, once we got that instituted and things were going there, one of the very first pieces of legislation I passed, got passed, was uh, open registration. Prior to the time we we did not have open. You had to, if you wanted a registration drive, you had to go to the Board of Elections and get a registrar, if you could find one who would come into the black community and, and register folks that way. What the legislation I introduced just opened it up completely. Anybody could go down and get a handful of, uh, and take them back to the board, then the board would uh, do whatever they had to do to certify them, that type of thing. So that was one of the first steps. And I remember one Republican legislator asking me at that time, so you just want everybody to vote, don't you? <laughs> I said, gee, you know. <laughs> but then, um, as we moved forward, as things began to happen, I, I, I got involved. Uh, it, it, was, it was just necessary that we start doing things. And 
Well, I had a lot of lessons that I learned along the way. For instance, second primaries. I was a victim of a second primary battle. I won the primary for a congressional seat and I lost it because I only got 46, 47 percent of the vote instead of the 50 percent plus one. So all of these things led up to, to and, and like I said, the Help America Vote Act led up to my becoming involved in what we could do to get more people out to the polls without any problems. Mm -hmm. um, did you return for the 50th anniversary of the Selma March? No. 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 Uh, we were hung up over there in that place. Mm -hmm. So you were in the North Carolina, were you in the North Carolina House Chamber on the day that the um, House Bill 589 passed? Yes, I was. Can you describe the atmosphere and what you were thinking? <laughs> I just got through testifying on that. <laughs> all right, 589. You want the history on it? Is all that, of it. You want all of it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> it started out with a bill requiring photo ID. 12 pages long that, that we opposed. It got passed by the House in the early part of, of 2013, I think it was. What's this? This is, yeah, 2013. Got passed in the early part of the House and sent to the Senate. We had languished in the Senate for some time. Uh, and we said, well, maybe they're just going to kill it in the Senate and not do anything about it. Then the decision came out violating, uh, outlawing Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, which had an effect on Section 5, which was a pre-clearance thing. Section 4 was that portion which set up the machinations by which you had to get pre-clearance, though it defined it. They knocked Section 4 out altogether. Two days after the Supreme Court passed that decision, the Senate came out with a 57-page bill of 589 had gone from 12 pages to 57 pages. Nobody knew anything that was in it uh, except the folks who drew it. The process then was they amended the bill in the Senate, put these 57 pages together, passed it in the Senate, and sent it over to the House, and we were to vote on it the next day. And what we, we had to accept that or it was, it was an up or down vote, no argument or anything like that except what we did. You couldn't amend it, it was just you had to accept or not accept what they sent over and go to conference if you didn't accept it. Well, they decided, it, it, there wasn't any question that they were lockstep, Republicans were lockstep, they were going to accept it. Uh, we argued, and, and, and it's hard, we argued three and a half, four hours on the bill there were 31 arguments done on that bill that day. Only two Republicans spoke for it. That was the leader, the, 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 the uh, rules chairman, and the sponsor of the original House Bill 589. They were the only two that spoke on it, for it. None of the other Republicans said a word about it. Our arguments ranged from why are you doing this, why, why are you taking away those things that cause more people to go out and vote. Nobody could understand why anybody would, would want to cut down, which is what House Bill 589 did when you started, uh, you know, same-day registration, uh, the extended uh, early voting times. All of these things were included in that Senate version of it. And we, uh, there were, 20, like I say, 29 of us voted, spoke against it, and uh, it was, uh, I think, uh, the part that I said uh, that sort of caught everybody's attention was that, that I said they could take this piece of abomination, consign it to the streets of hell, there to remain forever, and sat down and shut up. Well, we, of course, uh, when the vote was called, all of the Democrats to a person, black and white, stood up, bowed their head, held hands, stood up and bowed their head on the, as, as, as a demonstration telling them, you know, this, this is bad. And that was it. That's what happened. <clears throat> Do you know, what exactly was your immediate reaction following the decision after well, you left the chamber? You mean, when, when they voted on it? Uh -huh. uh, I mean, my, my decision, my feeling, mm -hmm. 
the same as I had before I went in there. We knew we were, we were outnumbered anyway. We knew they were going to pass it. And uh, the only thing that we could count on would be uh, them passing it and then eventually getting into the court system on it, where we are right now on it. And uh, like I say, I just, I just testified about two months, two or three months mm -hmm. ago in the hearing in, in Winston-Salem on it. Can you tell us about what you said in your testimony? Uh, just the fact that <clears throat> we didn't, that we, we never understood why people wanted to put impediments in uh, involving people's right to exercise their franchise. It was, uh, you, you, you took away those items that, that, in, in, that people could use. You could get more people to the polls. You could get more people involved in the system. And that was the whole uh, meaning of what we passed when we were in charge, so that you would have more people turning out. I mean, uh, our, our turnouts, we were, prior to the time that we passed all of the legislation involving voting, we were 46th in the nation in turnout. Mm -hmm. I mean, and by the time we got all the other legislation passed, we had gone from 46th in the nation to 11th in the nation in turnout. So that showed you that, that it was working, it was getting people out to the polls, it was getting them to vote. So why do you want to, wh I mean, wh why is it necessary for you to do this? To put all these impediments in, 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 in place so that you can then go back to your standing the way you were 46 in the country. Mm -hmm. that, was basic, that was basically my, <clears throat> my testimony uh, there. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna pass it to you. I'm just gonna continue the conversation here. Okay. Um, so in their decision in Shelby, the Supreme Court struck down the heart of the Voting Rights Act um, that required Southern states to get federal approval before changing voting laws. Um, this decision was made because the justices believe these protections were appropriate for the 1960s, but today are no longer necessary. And Chief Justice Roberts has even said that special treatment for minority groups is outdated. How, how do you respond to this argument? Well, the first, first off, we had been warned uh, when 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 uh, when the Voting Rights Act came up for when uh, you, you know you, you had to do it every 10, 15 years. I mean, but the last before the last time that it came up, we had been warned that we needed to go back and look at Section Four because things had changed to a point where there may you needed to add some additional criteria or he needed to change the criteria and that type of thing. We didn't do it. And that, uh, but in spite of that, uh, there was still, Section 4 we felt was still needed. But we also had Section 2, which was there, and nobody had bothered Section 2, so they didn't bother Section 2, so we felt we were still in pretty good shape with Section 2, which has turned out to be basically true. But uh, it was still, uh, they are now working on Congress is working on changing Section 4 so that we can go back to pre-clearance. Okay, so Reverend Barber has even said that today um, we have less voting rights today than at the time of the Voting Rights Act. Would you go that far? I would, I would say that we had been more disenfranchised as a result of 589 than we were. We, we, we had Prior to prior to 65, we were beginning to move in the right direction, but we had to have a push. And that push was the Voting Rights Act, which put into law what needed to be done. Um, and when you s stop and think about, with Section 4 being the critical part of that legislation, and taking that out, and you don't have any criteria for pre-clearance now. It is leading. Barbara could be right. It, it could be that, that we, because first you took seven to ten days off of early voting. You knocked out same-day registration. Uh, you knocked out uh, uh, voting in a different precinct and, and presenting a balance that way. Uh, you got photo ID in there. <laughs> you talk about photo ID. I'm thinking, I, the reason I laughed a little bit there, because I'm thinking about what we passed the other day. 
you, you got to have a birth certificate now to go to a, use a restroom or something. So it just gets bad, worse and worse and worse down the line. But, but my thing was, well, voting is a constitutional right. And there should not be any impediment there at all. But you're going to require folks to show photo ID. Uh, and uh, so if you got to show a photo ID for voting, then why don't you have to show a photo ID for enforcing your uh, sec your, your, your Amendment 2 rights? Mm -hmm. Every time you go buy a weapon, show you got to show a photo. You don't have to do that for that, but that's a constitutional right, they say. Anyway, uh, the whole thing to me is that we are retrogressing. They raised a question about the fact that when, when we did redistricting, and uh, back in uh, in eleven twelve, when they did redistricting, why the Justice Department approved what they did in redistricting. That was because there was no retrogression. The fact of the matter was what they did, they added more predominantly black precincts, which is now the subject of the suit now. But anyway, that's, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. You go ahead on. So, question. yeah, you're saying we're retrogressing and that Barber might be on to something here. Yeah, I, I think he may be on to something there because if if what they passed in, in 589 is allowed to stand, you, you're going to be, you're going to see people. I mean, photo ID, uh, you you now have some. They came back and found out they might be in trouble with that, so they came back and correct tried to correct it. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, they made it worse. Okay. Um. Because uh, you know what you've got to show, uh, mm -hmm. and it just puts more loopholes, mm -hmm. more, more hurdles that you have. So my question there is: Did you expect this, considering this were eight years out of Obama's presidency? Did you see this coming? considering that he is the first African-American president? Well, I, I didn't know. I did not see it coming. I really didn't. Uh, I, I thought that, you know, it, it had worked to a point that you had a black president. I never thought, I never thought I'd see a black president in my lifetime. I never thought I'd see a woman pr president in my lifetime. But it looks like uh, if I don't die tomorrow, I'm gonna see, I've seen it all. Uh, but, 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 uh, no, I, it, it's just that, that uh, I think the impetus came from the fact that, that how do you say this? Well, I, I'll tell you what I told the Republicans. When they took over, I said, you know, we taught you all how to win elections. And you took advantage of that, and now you're the majority, and you can do whatever you want to do. I said, but the one thing we, we, that, that you didn't learn, that we didn't teach you, was how to govern. You don't know what you're doing. So you give us another 140 years and we'll teach you how to govern. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it, it, that, that's, that's just the bottom line in the whole thing. They, they got the power, now they can uh, just start retrogression all over again. There's nothing stopping them from doing it. And, and, and they're beginning to do it. You see bills being passed, for instance, the Greensboro City Council bill that passed. The Wake County County Commissioner's Bill that was passed that changed the whole thing that affected uh, uh, minority neighborhoods. All of that, nothing to stop that. And, and they're going to be doing that as long as this thing sits there. And that's why uh, these court cases are so important. Um, so talking about why this is happening, I wanted to address the issue of voter fraud and groups like the Voting, Voting Integrity Project. Um, you may disagree with these groups and their methods, but the vote is special to them, just like it is to you. One could even argue that perhaps you're trying to do the same thing, which is to protect the vote. What do you say to these people? Show me the fraud. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's been proved in North Carolina, less than one-tenth of one percent fraud, has, and I, I cannot recall, and I don't think anybody else can recall, any case that's been tried on, on vote fraud in this state. Uh, I was, I, I listened very closely when, when 589 came out. They had these public hearings and on, on trying, they, they tried their darndest to uh, say that it was all to protect the vote. 
the truth in voting. Uh, they call it they call it the the Viva Act. Uh, uh, what I call uh, I forget what what the acronym is, but it's uh, but that. I call it the Voter Intimidation and Vilification Act. It was my viva, not theirs. But what what it does, I mean, it, it just takes everything away. There was a bit of testimony that came out, I remember, in one of the public hearings that we had. A lady from Durham came over and said, yes, I have seen cases of fraud. I have seen where a dead man voted. And she did the, She made the mistake of naming the individual that she claimed was dead and had voted. I knew the individual that she named, claimed was dead. He was dead, but it, he wasn't the one that voted. It was his son who had his same name and lived at his same address that voted. And when they sort of backed off. Then somebody from the mountains came down and said, well, in Asheville, they had 20 or 30 incidents of, of fraud up there. We contacted the Board of Elections in Asheville. There was no such thing. Nobody had, had, had done anything. So show me the fraud. Okay. And, and I mean, fine, that, that, that's fine. If they want, if they want, we need, if there is, if it is there, it needs to be rooted out. Well, even if, you know, they have proved like one or two cases, do you think that if one vote, hypothetically, is casted fraudulently, does that taint the election? No. No. If you had massive, well, no. Uh -uh. Why, why, why would, somebody's going to try to game the situation. Don't care what you do. Don't care what you're involved in. Or anything. Some, some one person's going to do. Does that mean it, 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 it's not like one rotten apple in the barrel, which is going to probably affect? No. It's, it's not going to do that. I mean, you got to show me that people are gaming the situation all the way up and down the line, not one person or two people. No. Okay. And um, if you, when you find those one or two people, mm -hmm. you prosecute them. Okay. Um, just sort of in an interview, you've said that Republicans don't want black folks. They don't want African Americans to vote. However, your Republican counterparts are still insisting that this law isn't about race. Do you believe them? No. No. We were the ones that got the Voting Rights Act passed. We were the ones that took advantage of the Voting Rights Act. We took advantage of the Voting Rights Act to a point that, that, that it inspired a nation to elect a black president, uh, and then that black president gets elected, and the very first thing that comes out of the mouth of the Republicans is that black president is not going to serve but one term. And then they are emboldened, and uh, 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 in, in after after the president got elected for the second term, uh, one, one of no, it was first term when when he first term one of the leaders in the Republican Party on the floor started jumping up talking about photo ID and all this and. Uh, Somebody asked, asked a question. He said, we are in charge now, and we will do what we want to do. And me and my smart mouth jumped up and said, well, we know who the president is. And he sat down and shut up and went on about his business. But yes, they, in my book, they have a problem with black folks. Another example of that, the grassroots the Tea Party folks in the Republican Party in North Carolina elected a black chairman of the North Carolina Republican Party. They're not trying to get him out of office. They have never given, the, the, the elite in the Republican Party had never given them, given him the opportunity to run that party. So they've got a problem with black folks. And, and, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. yeah, so I think Reverend Barber, um, I have a quote here, he's in agreement with you. He's saying the Republicans are sort of doing this, you know, when Obama won, like you were saying, they yeah. were threatened, and now they're seeing this as an attempt to roll African Americans back, is what he says. Yeah. But my question is, is this just reflect a change in the state and the legislature, become, legislature becoming more partisan? Is this just Republicans trying to hang on to power? Where do you draw the line between this being about race and them disenfranchising a group of people, or just is this about power and they're just trying to hang on? Um, it's a little bit of both. 
uh, because minorities were beginning to gain some semblance of power, particularly in the political arena, uh, the, they were never, they were really never open to uh, uh, black folks being involved anyway in it. There, there was never any open invitation as far as African Americans were concerned to become a, a strategic part. We had Michael Steele, who was chairman of the National Republican Party for a little while, but he didn't last long either. Just like Hassan is chair of the North Carolina Republican Party, he's not lasting because they're trying to get um, uh, their their central committee did a, did a uh, no confidence vote on him, and now they're trying to go to convention. I think they have a convention next month or something like that, trying to oust him out of it. So 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 it, it's. To me, it is a racial thing, even though they deny that, that, it, that, that it is not racial. That's, what else is it? Uh, and and, and uh, somebody, I'm trying to remember, in this last session, somebody called me and said, well, you all, you all are always raising the race question. We don't raise the race question. They raise the race question. I can remember several arguments on the floor in the House where, where uh, we didn't have to raise the race question because some of the Tea Party folks over there raised it themselves. So uh, that's, that's what, I mean, how else can you interpret it other than the fact that, that we were getting too bigoted, too uppity, too whatnot. We were beginning to become an integral part of our whole society. So you're saying that this is more about prejudice and their own bias against a group of people rather than them just trying to have power? It's a question of both. It's, it's both. Okay. It's both. Uh, they've got the power now, and they're going to use the power to, in my book, put down every, all the progress that's been made over 140 years, particularly in this state. If you, if you go back and look at the history and I don't know whether you want all this or not, but, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. That, that if, you, if you go back to Reconstruction era, right after the Civil War, uh, black folks were, were in power then, in, particularly in the South, and were grand uh, purveyors of the Republican Party. You had the only legislature in the South during Reconstruction after the Civil War was in South Carolina. They had a majority black legislature in South Carolina that put in public schools, clean up the hospitals, clean up the prisons and whatnot. Um, then uh, you, had, you had a black senator out of Louisiana. You had black Congress people serving. You, you had blacks working all over the place during the Reconstruction era. In 1876, during the presidential election year, uh, Democratic Samuel Tilden, who was the governor of New York, won the presidency. But there was a question, sort of like the situation that happened in Florida when Al Gore ran, the hanging Chad situation. There were three states that, that they had some problems with. March the 4th of 1877 was approaching which was supposed to be an inauguration day, nothing had been settled on the presidency. The Democrats, the, 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 the Republicans came to the Democrats and said, look, if you put our man in the White House, we will take the troops out of the South. And everybody agreed on that. And Rutherford B. Hayes got to be president rather than Samuel Tilden got to be president of the United States. The Republicans pulled the troops out of the South, and this was the post-Reconstruction era we are in now, when Jim Crow took effect by an openly black, anti-black Democratic Party. And uh, that happened, that went all the way up until the late, late 20s when Oscar de Priest, for instance, won a seat in Congress from Illinois in 1928, somewhere around when and then Franklin Roosevelt came in. Things began to move and uh, in another direction. That's my lesson in oh, history. Yeah, yeah. And it's like you're saying, this is about 
Race, I have a quote here that you said that this is basically a party situation and that most African Americans vote Democratic. And this has fed into sort of what you're talking about before, your attempts to have early registration and sort of get more African Americans and therefore, like you said, Democrats yeah. to vote. How is this any different? Isn't this just sort of a game of politics? You're trying to get more votes for your side. They're trying sure. So that's the name of the game. Okay. You you, uh, you you get more you get more votes for your side. Uh, you therefore have much more of a say. You can fight off all of the things that may be oppressive or anti or whatever. Uh, if if you have the numbers determine your where you live, the way you eat, the way you numbers determine what the government is going to be, how it's going to act, and government is going to determine how you're going to live and what you're going to do. So yeah, it, it, it's it's a question of numbers, and uh, uh, I told somebody on the floor. I said, yeah, I, yeah, I'm I'm a Democrat. I said, and I will go with any party that's going to tell me that I am free to do what I want to do without any indication of prejudice anywhere. If you're going to, if, if you're going to help me move forward, then yes, I'm going to be with you. The Republican Party has shown no signs of wanting to even think about it. I mean, give me a break. Even the recent legislation, this, this bill that we just passed, House Bill 2 that we just passed, uh, they have a, an antagonism toward gays, LGBT folks, anyway. And if you, you say, all right, we're going to pass an anti-discrimination law in statute in this state so that the cities and counties don't have to do it, and you leave out sexual orientation or, 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 or gender in there, you, that now becomes a discriminatory statute. Mm -hmm. so, so, I mean, all of this wraps up, yeah, yeah, uh, it takes numbers. And the only way you're going to reverse all of this is by numbers. I guess my last thing is, why haven't more Democratic leaders sort of come out and said, like, very clearly, this is, a, it seems like they're hesitant to say this is about race? Because uh, you have some Democratic leaders that still have that old mindset, and, but it, it takes a little time to change them, too. But once they see that uh, we bleed the same blood, uh, we eat the same food, we have the same ills, that everybody else has, they're beginning to change their mind. And we've still got, I mean, there are people in the, leg Democrats in the legislature right now who think that we ought not be there. What is that mindset exactly that they're stuck in? The, the, the mindset is that it's the old slave mentality mindset. Mm. You, uh, in, in the hierarchy on the planet, you had the plantation owner, you had the, the, slave, the slave driver, then you had the slave. To keep that blue class white worker uh, from trying to interfere with the, the plantation owner's property and whatnot, he made a lower class of people so that that uh, plantation boss, the overseer, he would have somebody to step on and wouldn't be bucking the plantation owner. It's, it's that type of mentality that that that. Uh, when you start getting things, well, let me give you a real crude example. Mm -hmm. there, wasn't a, there wasn't a problem with heroin or, or cocaine in this country as long as it was confined to the black communities. Now it has hit the white communities and it's now become a national problem. That's the type of mindset that, 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 that you run into. And you think that, um your fellow Democratic congressmen have that mindset that are fighting with you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, legislators. Legislators. Yeah, yeah. Because we don't have but three Democratic congressmen in this state, <laughs> and, and <laughs> we, we now have three. I don't know tell what we're going to have next week. Mm -hmm. But no, they, yeah, they, they, there are some folks who have that same, that same mentality that irrespective of how much education you have, I mean, when, when I first went to the legislature, I went to the legislature in 1973. 1973 session was my first session. And I wonder what I had gotten myself into. 
Well, to, to, to back up a little bit, Martin, Martin King was a close friend of mine. Mm -hmm. Stayed with us and all of that. And we used to talk all the time about how things were going. And Martin was the one that said, you know, Mickey, you ought to be involved in politics. I said, Martin, you're out of your mind. I said, why would I be involved in it? You know, and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, when I finally, I, I ran in 60, 64, 66, and 68 and lost. In 64, I lost by about 120 votes. In 66, I lost, and they began to start changing the rules. Uh, you had to run for a particular seat and whatnot. And then in 68, I ran again, but that was the year Martin got killed and the fire went out and, uh, on my belly, so to speak, and, and I just threw it out altogether. But in 72, uh, there came an open seat. We got an extra seat in Durham County. And I was encouraged to run at that point. I was, by that time, I'd been chief assistant district attorney in Durham and gotten to know a whole lot of other folks, all, all these types of things. Anyway, uh, I got elected in 72, went to the 73 session. And before I got there, it, it, it dawned on me that here I am about to join the most powerful legislative body in the country. And the reason that was because North Carolina did not have veto, the governor did not have veto power. So anything that passed the legislature was law, whether you liked it or not. You didn't have a governor to veto it, to send it back to get the changes made. So I said, here I am about to, about to uh, you know, join this most powerful body. Till I got on the floor and heard the first speech by a white Democrat. I said, I'm home free. Because he showed he showed me an ignorance that, that I didn't think existed in anybody's way of thinking. And, 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 and this is, this is, these are the things that you, you learn along the way. You, you, you know that, that, that uh, that's Obama's problem. He's smarter than most of those folks. Mm -hmm. That's his whole problem. And you don't expect that out of a black person. I, long way of saying it. I was just wondering, what was the racial representation like when you first joined the state legislature? There were three of us. Mm -hmm. Henry Fry, Joy Johnson, and me. Henry Fry was the first. Henry got elected in 1968. Joy Johnson got elected in 1970. I got elected in 1972. And we ran a game on the folks over there. Well, well we did. Joy Johnson was a minister. And he was a hellraiser. I was the rebel. I came out of the civil rights movement. And Henry Fry was a conciliator. And we would run that game on them too. We got even, even got some of the legislation that we introduced passed. And then white folks began started coming to us to handle their legislation for them. I mean, you know, it, it, but 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 here again, I mean, grudgingly they did it, and. Uh, uh, and I guess if, if if I want to point to something, in in 2008, the same year that that uh, Obama was elected, I was named I I was named chair of I was senior chair of appropriations for the state. So, you know, I'm not supposed to have that kind of knowledge, but I, and I, I served two terms as senior chair of appropriations, running the whole state budget, uh, which was the first and and. But, I mean, hey, are anyway. No, anyway. Are, are you no longer serving in that position? Oh, no. No. I, I'm, I'm lucky to be, I'm lucky to have a seat. <laughs> I'm lucky, uh, the, the, when, 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 when the Republicans took over, um, the very first thing they said to Joe Hackney, who had been the speaker before but was now relegated to minority leader, the first thing they told him, say, we will be all right if you shut Mickey Michelle up. <laughs> and Joe said, we're going to be in bad shape. <laughs> yeah, I mean, anyway. So you've de dedicated your career to protecting voting rights for your constituents and making sure that they are accurately represented. Um, this legislature has reversed much of that progress that you've made. Um, how did you and other Democrats lose this fight? Or like how did we what? Lose this fight. Well, we lost it through the election process. Mm -hmm. 
because because the Republicans outvoted us. They got more folks in there, and they got that super majority in there now, which allows them to do whatever they want to do. So I went to sleep at the wheel, and uh, by not by not by not really doing what we had, not following the principles that we had laid out, uh, we should they they should not have they should not have, have done that. Uh, it, you know, there, there are a lot of things involved in this whole process, like, like redistricting, for instance. They talk about gerrymander. Uh, and they said, well, you know, Democrats did it, so we can do it too. But we never did gerrymandering as bad as they have done it. Uh, the year in, 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 in the 10, 11, uh, for that 2000, 2000, 2001, 2002, our redistricting gave, we had 13 representatives, congressional representatives. Seven were Democrats, six were Republicans. Now, we could have, we could have probably gerrymandered the same way they did to got them to 10 and 3, but we didn't do it that way. We kept our numbers so that, that we didn't have, didn't have veto-proof majorities uh, when we gerrymandered, so to speak, uh, because you had uh, roughly, uh, you had 52 Republicans and 68 Democrats in there, which was, which was basically representative of the way the population, the, the political population was. Now, uh, they have gerrymandered so much, I mean, they, they've just gone down and just done a whole bunch of stuff. But anyway. Um, I. I actually spoke with a, um, a congressman for Durham County. I'm forgetting whether he was in the rep, a Democratic congressman um, or state congressman. Um, I'm forgetting. His, sorry. You're talking about a con U.S. Congressman? Sorry, no, not congressman. Legislature. State, state legislature. I'm sorry. I keep making that mistake. Um, but I spoke with him the other day, and he was saying that the original um, redrawing of the districts um, for North, Car like the new redrawing of districts mm -hmm. for North Carolina, had been revoked by a three-judge panel. The first draft. That those were congressional districts. Oh, okay. 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 There is a suit now, which is going to be heard beginning April the seventh mm -hmm. next week, on state redistricting. Okay. And we we're, we're hoping we're going to get the same result out of that that we got out of congressional okay. redistricting. Um, so, in an interview, you said that you are proud that you have been able to work in the legislature and give back to your community. Your constituents are clearly very important to you. Have they voiced concerns on this issue on the voting rights? Oh, issue? very definitely. No question mm -hmm. about it. Uh, even statewide, even those people who were not my constituents have, have voiced concerns about it. But here in Durham, Durham, uh, liberal bastion, if you want to call it that, uh, everybody's complained about it. Uh, but Statewide Democrats, both black and white, have complained about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have some of your um, have some of your constituents lost the ability to vote as a result? I haven't heard uh, uh, of anybody. I do know that uh, several of my friends who are constituents uh, went to the wrong place a year or so ago and. Uh, they wouldn't let them vote there, mm -hmm. do a provisional ballot there. Other than that, no. Uh, the, the, the thing is that, that in spite of, that, that we're going to succeed in spite of. Uh, we're not going to, you throw any roadblock, you, we've had many, many roadblocks before, and we've overcome those roadblocks. We're not going to let these roadblocks they're throwing up now deter us from trying to get them changed. And the only way, if they think they're going to discourage us by putting all this in there, I think they got a different thought coming. And, and it's beginning to register now in the community that in spite of what they're trying to do to you, you got to get in there and keep fighting and do whatever it takes so that these numbers will begin to increase more and more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Like, photo, as much as I hate photo ID, I'm encouraging folks, don't let that deter you. Mm -hmm. 
if you go to a precinct and they say, this is not your precinct, don't let that stop you from going to the precinct that you're supposed to go to. Mm -hmm. Don't let anything deter you. Do it, and then we can put it back to the way it should be. Um, do you have any concerns now about re-election that you didn't have before the, the new law? My re-election? Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, have any re opposition. Sorry? I don't have any opposition. You don't have, oh, okay. Well, then no. <laughs> <laughs> That's easier for you, I suppose. <laughs> um, well, then. Um, in 2008, the minority vote was hi the highest it had ever been, and then in 2010, Republicans dominated the vote. What happened? The, 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 the drop-off was, was, uh, was, was very apparent because this is one time we went to s sleep at the switch. Uh, in 2008, Obama won North Carolina. In 2012, he didn't win North Carolina by just a few votes. Uh, in two years ago, 2014, Kay Hagan lost because she would not embrace the Obama platform, which would have turned out more folks. Mm -hmm. It's just that, that we, we, we thought we had it. Some folks thought we had it made now that Obama was sitting in the White House mm -hmm. and forgot the fact that they had to keep up what they did in 2008. We're getting back to that now. We, 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 by 2020, things will change. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we were proud last, in 2014, uh, North Carolina was the only state in the union where black folks in the legislature didn't lose anybody. The black, in fact, it, it increased. Um, in her Super Tuesday victory speech, Hillary Clinton specifically discussed North Carolina's voting restrictions, um, stating that she plans to, quote, break down barriers for voters in North Carolina who have been systematically disenfranchised, end quote. Um, other states have passed similar voter ID laws, but why do you think that the state of North Carolina specifically is go getting national attention over their own voting Because rights. of the overreach, not only mm -hmm. photo ID, but the other matters that, 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 that we were beginning. Like I say, what was originally, what was cut out in 589, that was why, because we were, we were, we were on the road to progression. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, be, vote was beginning to pick up, folks were beginning to come into the state looking at it as, 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 as a, not necessarily a liberal state, but a state where everybody was being treated, you know, on, on a sort of an equal, on an equal plane. Education was moving up the ladder. I mean, you got a bunch of folks in there now that want to do away with public schools as we know them. Mm -hmm. You know, why, why would anybody now want to come into North Carolina? When, 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 when you got, when you, you have opened up your voting process, where more folks were becoming, like I say, when you move from 46th to 11th, uh, you, you know that you, you, you've got a state that, 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 that's operating and people would want to do that. But now, no. Uh, we're the laughing stock because we, what, once we were progressive, now we are retrogressive. Mm -hmm. We were once looked at as a, as, as a beacon in the South because of guys like Terry Sanford, mm -hmm. uh, Bob Scott, all these folks who, who had forward-looking ideas. Mm -hmm. we, our whole education, our university system was our pride and one of the best systems, was the best system in the country. Our community college system was the best system in the country. And we were making strides in our public education system. Till these folks came in and took over and then started cutting back. When I took over, uh, I'll give you an example, when I took over as senior chair of appropriations, we were in the midst of, 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 of a terrific depression. They call it a recession. It was a depression we were in at that time. And you, if you go back and, and, and you think about it, the 43rd president of the United States got the United States out of debt. We were on a rosy road. The 44th president got us in a war left us in a whole bunch of debt. The 45th president brought us out of it. So, I mean, 
North Carolina was looked at, 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 at I mean, we were one, we were rated at the top in any category you wanted, in, in recruiting businesses, in quality of life, all of these things, we were rated very highly. Now it's going back down the tubes. We had climbed to a point where we were 22nd in teacher pay. Now we've gone back mm -hmm. to being in the 40s, actually 49th in teacher's pay. We had climbed the ladder in per pupil spending for students in our public schools. We have now gone back to 47, 48 in per pupil. We used to look down our nose at South Carolina. Mm -hmm. South Carolina's per pupil spend expenditure is much higher than North Carolina. The teacher pay is much higher than North Carolina. They have recruited not only one, but two automobile industries in there, and now have an airplane manufacturing plant in there. So who's looking down who knows at who now? Mm -hmm. because, because after the takeover by the Republic, none of this has happened. And if you pick up the paper this morning, you see a company that was coming into Durham County is going to spend $20 million, uh, uh, and now they are rethinking that because of House Bill 2. These are headlines in this morning's paper. I mean, hey. Why do you think these congressmen keep being re or being elected that are making the state a retrogressive state? Because, uh, well, one reason is because of their redistricting and their gerrymandering and redistricting, which is why now they, they're going to have to look at it in a different aspect since, and, and we don't know what the court is going to do with the new plans that have come in there. They still haven't made a decision on that yet. They may, uh, uh, well, once, they, they haven't made a decision on the congressional plan, the final congressional plan that came out, but they still got to deal with the state, and state, uh, House and, and Senate races, mm -hmm. and if you look at the panel that's discussed, that, that, that that's going to hear that, you get the tendency that they may start turning that around also. Mm -hmm. And if it does, it's going to throw the elections, and then we may be able to get rid of a lot of folks. Yeah, but the, under the current redistricting plan, they built it that way. Mm -hmm. They gave us our little black folks. They gave us our little niche, and said, "Now you got yours." We don't want to hear nothing from them. They went on and did their thing. But now with the division in their party, they, they've, got, they've, got, they've got very serious divisions in their party, in the state party now, because the, uh, the, the, uh, these are the, the tea folks, tea party folks, mm -hmm. have, have, have said that they're not congress conservative enough said that the speaker, the current Republican speaker, and who all the, the elite uh, have left out the Tea Party. They're just not conservative enough. So now they've got a big argument going in a lo almost the same type of argument going on a local level that's on a national level, which if they keep keep going, is going to do away with the Republican Party as you know it. But anyway. Uh, so if you had the opportunity to speak to younger people that wanted to get involved with voting rights issues, what would you say to them? Go for it. I mean, th this, is, this is the only way that you can express. When, when I first got back, when I first got in office, one of the people who would come in the office to see me, uh, the very first question I asked, are you registered and do you vote? They say, no, I won't talk to you. Because you don't believe in yourself. Why are you coming in there talking to me if you don't go out there? And, uh, so you, you, as young people, you've got to learn it. You've got to learn the issues. You've got to... But, I mean, uh, I tell, especially young black folks, you're not where you are today. You, 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 know, you don't know what it took to get you where you are today. Even white young folks, you are not there because our movement helped you. I mean, you wouldn't have had Pell Grants. You wouldn't have had all these things that you go pay the rest of your life on, but... Uh, if you put us back in power, we'll try to ease that up for you too. <laughs> but 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 I mean, uh, what if if you think back, if you really think back on the situation, what we were fighting for, not only helped us, but it helped the entire body politic because it it freed up a lot of things. It 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 brought them out. Uh, I mean it. It's just that simple. It was a whole freedom movement. Mm 
it freed up everybody, not just a particular race. Mm -hmm. So besides being registered to vote and educating yourself on current issues, what do you think is the most powerful thing young people can do to get involved? Get involved? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, when I, and I'm not saying that to be facetious or anything. You, 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 you've got to understand that your very existence depends on the way that your government treats you, the way that your government operates. If you think government's too big, if you think it's too small, if you think it's not doing enough, if you've got ideas that you can present, you ought to do it. You, got, you, you have an obligation to do it, to enjoy what you are enjoying in this country. You've got an obligation to do it, to keep it up. And then you've got an obligation to make sure that everybody has that opportunity that you have. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Sorry, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? That you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> Any specific topics? Yeah. Any what? Any specific, Any specific topics? topics? You, to <laughs> you, you, you run me. Well, that, 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 I, I mean, I could, I could, we, we could run the gamut. <laughs> Let me ask you a question from back here. So you describe yourself as a as a rebel in your in your early. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. What, what's your view of the Black Lives Matter movement, and and, and how do you um, how much contact do you have? I don't have any contact there, but but I. Do you I, see it? I uh, it's an issue that cuts both ways. All lives to me matter, but when you begin to 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 when, when things begin to fall disproportionately in a certain way, then you, you have to take that. I, I believe that black lives matter. I believe white lives matter. But uh, we're not being, you're not being subjected to what we're being subjected to in terms of, of killings. Mm -hmm. so, so you have to, if maybe black lives matter, will get you to realize that all lives matter. The same way the Civil Rights Movement made you believe that all people are equal. And one other question. I, I, uh, what do you think um, uh, Secretary Clinton has to do uh, to inspire uh, the kind of turnout and support among black voters that her husband had, that President Obama had? I think she's done it so far. She's done it. But for but for the minority vote in the South that she's received already, she she would not be in the position that she's in right now. I mean, look at South Carolina, uh, all, where, where black folks turned out, or and and uh, it's going to take that kind of thing. And she and she's not pandering to anybody. She's just helping folks move along and putting out a program that most folks can understand and can live with. Uh, uh, she and Bernie Sanders are probably on the same thing, but it's just the approach that they take as to how to do it. Both want to see things done, but you have to be careful of uh, the approach you take in doing these things. Um, Bernie is more has more of a social. I, I and, and uh, sorry, you, I, I, I I have a saying. I say we say we've got to get rid of we've got to get rid of the socialists in our midst. And you all got to get rid of the sociopath in your midst. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's any chance that uh, Donald Trump could be elected president? Yeah. Yeah. I really do. I, why? Because he is touching a nerve that nobody else seems to want to touch. He's doing it in a very crude way. People are angry. People, even though we've, we, we've come out of the recession, uh, jobs are picking up, unemployment is low. All these, but wages have remained flat. People are not seeing the progress that they thought they should be seeing, and that's because of the recalcitrance of of, 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 of the Congress, which works in an opposite direction. When 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 you've got a Congress sitting there, that their only thing, the only thing they got on their mind is making the president look bad. When Mitch McConnell comes in and says, in we're going to make sure he's a one-term president. When you come up, the president says, I'm going to nominate. You know, it's going to tickle me uh, when, uh, and, and I say this, when Hillary is elected president and this Congress did not approve 
this president's appointment to the Supreme Court, and Hillary's going to have to make an appointment to the Supreme Court, and she's going to appoint Obama to the Supreme Court. <laughs> I mean, hey, others have done worse. I mean, <laughs> Taft, I think, uh, who was it? Yeah, Taft that was president one time. Got it. There was a president that got appointed to the Supreme Court. That was Taft. Yeah. I thought it was Taft, yeah. Uh, but, I mean, it, they better go ahead on and, and, and confirm this man while they got something they can be pretty sure of rather than wait. And even if Trump, get, I, I don't think Trump will get elected. I really don't. I, it, there's a possibility he could. But I think uh, the Republican Party right now, to me, is shot. I mean, if he is not given that nomination, he going he to go out and form a third party. It's going to be all these angry white folks that, he, that, that, that are going to be there who have seen their wages stay stagnant. Who's, you know, it, it, it's a weird time we're living in. Yeah. So on a final note, we've talked about a lot of different topics. Is there anyone in mind um, that you think would be helpful for us to speak to? Anyone else? <laughs> have you talked with G.K. Butterfield, congressman for this? We tried to reach reach him, but he's uh, he's, well, he, he, he's got new duties right now. He's yeah. Congress chair of the Congressional Black yeah. Caucus. It keeps yeah. him. Yeah. We talked to his people. We may, we may still we still have a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. Have you talked to Larry Hall? Uh, no. You need to talk to Larry. Yeah. Larry is Larry is uh, is is the, the the technical word for it is he's the minority leader in the House, but. Uh, he doesn't term himself a minority leader. He's the Democratic leader in the House. Dan Blue, you talked to Dan? I interviewed him actually on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, great, great, okay. We talked to Henry Fry yesterday. Oh, great, great, great. Uh, you have a chance to talk with Rosanelle Eaton yet? We're going to see our mentor uh -huh. at the home, so we may see Rosanelle, depending on how she Great, great, great. She would, she would be very interesting to you. Great. Yeah. She's just the White House. Uh, yeah, 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 and, uh, but, um, y you know, you just, th th these are folks that, that are, these are my contemporaries, so to speak. Uh, that's about it, y'all. Yeah.